All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. We have a very, very special guest that I'm excited Hello, to have Welcome today. To um, let me mute the other stream. <laughs> uh, but today we have Dr. Anthony Mazarol. Uh, is, did I pronounce that the proper way? <laughs> um, unless you're really French, then no. But yeah, what, that's how we Americans pronounce it. Maserol. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, welcome. Uh, and I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, I, I follow uh, a lot of the, the work you're doing lately down in uh, the Peruvian Amazon. It's really cool. Uh, I, uh, Ivan, or Ivan, as a lot of people know him, Mikolji, a lot of people are familiar with him on the channel too. Uh, he's the one who initially kind of uh, said, check out what he's doing, you know, so... Uh, very cool work. Um, so I guess, would you like to just introduce yourself? Uh, you, I, you are so highly, uh, you know, accredited and everything, a Fulbright research fellow. I mean, I could go on, but uh, yeah, however yeah. you'd like to research or, or however you'd like to introduce yourself, I, I'm just going to tell the viewers, you're not, we're not messing around. This is a environmental science and biology professor at one of the most prestigious schools in the country. This guy knows his stuff about fish. I mean, the student to teacher ratio at your school is the best in the country, I hear. So, yeah, yeah, uh, pretty incredible. Uh, but, so, th thank you for your time, really. You know, I, I'm I've been a hobbyist for over fifty years. That's you know, that's what got me into my science. You know, some kids outgrow what they want to do. You know, when they're a kid. Well, when I first had my first tank, when I was about six, seven. You know, I I always wanted to study fish. Never knew what that meant. Never knew it would lead me to what I'm doing today. But it's, you know, fish have always been part of my life. Uh, and so it's it's led me to a career in academia. It's led me to start the research center. Um, it's, you know, led me to have a house full of fish tanks, a two-car garage that I converted into a fish room. And you <laughs> You can see my uh, my tank behind me uh, filled with wild discus from Peru. So it's you know I'm very cool. I'm surrounded by fish. Very cool. And uh, your wife, I take it, she uh, she also enjoys fish or tolerates fish. <laughs> she she enjoys fish. She ha actually has a little salt water tank mm -hmm. that's all hers that I'm not allowed to touch. Uh, she had fish even before we met, but we actually mm -hmm. met, she was a research volunteer for me uh, when I was doing research in the Red Sea in Israel on clownfish mating behavior. Uh, uh, this was way before Nemo. Uh, you know, Nemo <laughs> didn't get me to like clownfish. I worked on clownfish uh, since the 80s. So uh, that we actually met, she was a research volunteer for me. Uh, we needed, uh, research divers and so she was one of those volunteers now was that when you were if i researched correctly when you were spending time in jordan is that uh yeah in jordan but at first i was uh working out of uh, elat israel which is right across the gulf from where i did my fulbright okay okay yeah. and, and uh you know that's a really interesting fish i mean i i mostly cover freshwater fish but due to recent discoveries in the domestic betta splendens uh basically the fact that their their sex is not determined by their x or y chromosome you know it floats they've now found in domestic um we did a lot of uh content on the channel about um basically how fish change gender and yeah. sex I, I just i coming from an anthropology point of view i say gender and sex are different because you know gender in fish it, and in humans would be how you display yourself socially whereas sex being the actual physiological um characteristic but i was kind of curious uh to hear from a, a you know a professor of ichthyology or a, a you know studies fish not necessarily of ichthyology but um what what do you guys consider uh, when fish are playing a role like that? I mean, do you guys have sex and gender in the fish world, like the anthropology world, or is uh, it all just sex? It, it's all sex, but um, you know, there are some fish like uh, the antheus, um, the ocean goldfish. There's one in the Red Sea, Sudantheus quamapinus. 
Uh, and they're also sex changers. They're um, uh, protogynous hermaphrodites. So they start off okay. life as a female and then they change into a male. And it's um, Doug Shapiro showed it. It's based upon uh, ratios of, of fish that there's normally a eight to one ratio of females to males. So if it gets larger than that, then some, wow. then a, one of the females changes into a male, but it takes a couple of weeks for physiologically for them to change sex, but mm -hmm. behaviorally they change right away. I mean, instantaneously they will take on the male behaviors and start taking on the male colorations as well. So, Wow. In some ways that is, you know, that's the gender. Yeah. You know? yeah. So so we do see that in some fish. It's, it's it's just really interesting to me because you know, now they're finding that, you know, there's a frog with six chromosomes and maybe yeah. there's fish that have different chromosome organization than we originally yeah. thought. So it's just been kind of a, a coming from an anthropology archaeology background myself. It's been something I felt like I could get wrapped my head around a little bit uh kind of you know hey cultures are like that too and so i've been very interested plus i i, I uh, raise scarlet baddis and other mm -hmm. uh baddis species and they are notorious for being either subdominant males that look female or downright changing gender there's there's still there's one paper I've read about it, but other than that, there's not a whole lot of info on it yet. But well, there's there's also sneaker males in some, yeah. in some fish. You know, they take on the female color and female behaviors just so they can sneak copulations. Because you know, if they're not a dominant male, they can't reproduce. And I tell yeah. my students, you know, one or two eggs, if you're able to, you know, reproduce. Or, or fertilize one or two eggs, that's better than zero eggs. So oh, yeah. that's, that's why you have these sneaker males try to sneak into a male nest. Yeah, well, I've, I've looked at uh, some of um, David Resnick's work out of... Oh, yeah. uh, out of uh, uh, UCR. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he's, he's done some work about, you know, uh, guppies and live bears, and they're, they're just notorious for having one that looks like a female running in at the last minute yeah. and trying to get a touchdown, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, so th I, I, fish are endlessly fascinating for so many reasons to me, but that's one of the, the things that as a fish breeder, over time you start to learn these like little quirks and things about yeah. different species. And uh, it's always interesting. But uh, so I, I was, uh, I mean, I'm excited to have you here because I'm hoping that we can bring some attention to what you're doing down in the jungle in Peru. I mean, so many of us would love to go to the Amazon someday. I've never been. Um, and you know, it's, it's like a dream for a lot of us. And so I would love to hear a little bit about, um, what's led you down there and what it is you're up to down there kind of thing. Okay. What originally led me to South America is I was interested in looking at population genetics in discus. Um, primarily looking at what happens during high water with dispersal of the young, uh, you know, because especially discus, they have long care, so to speak, parental care where, you know, it can last up to a month. Uh, and then as the water rises, do those babies all move out together? Or do they yeah. disperse independently? So what I was trying to do is trying to find uh, discus and angelfish. Angelfish was easy to find, uh, but discus were tend to be found in Colombian areas that are uh, not very safe for even the Colombians to go to. Uh, and so... Right, that's the uh, FARC and other groups yeah, like that? Is yeah. that what... Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and so a lot of rebels there. So... It was discouraging. So at that point, I decided, well, where else could I go in the area? Brazil, of course, we know discus are in Brazil, but it's very difficult as a scientist to work in Brazil, um, you know, unless you're, you know, David Resnick or some big name in, in the field of, of fish biology. Well, I'm a little fish in a big pond. So I decided to go to Peru, um, started working there. Peru has discus. Even though most of the discus in the area that I work in are actually exotics, they're not from Peru. Oh, Peru interesting. Does have, Peru okay. does have 
uh, native discus, but they're found in the Putumayo River, which is the border between uh, Ecuador and and Peru, which is again not the best place to go. Is that uh, a warmer region then? Because I, I would, I mean, in my head, I just imagine that the Peruvian Amazon is probably a bit colder in some places. Is that slightly? But okay. what what is is to get to where I'm at, you have to go all the way down or up the Amazon River. So these fish would actually have to traverse the Amazon, which is completely different type of water than what we think of as Amazonian waters. Okay. So it's, it's white water filled with silt, pH of about 7, 8 to 8. Wow. Uh, conductivity, we measure conductivity in terms of microsiemens, about sure. three, 300 microsiemens, which TDS is really high. Yeah. You know, it's not in some of the streams I work with it in in Iquitos and around Iquitos, we get pHs of four, yeah, <laughs> and micro siemens of one, right? So basically, like Coca Cola, so yeah, it's pure or pure tea water. You know, you're yeah. making tea out of uh, RO water, and that's what it is. Uh, wow. So to be able to to move all that way uh, uh, in water that isn't the best, um, those fish can't make it that far. Yeah, so, so the that's fish there. We're actually transported there. So, is if you were to go from, I mean, just a little bit of geography for folks who may not be familiar with the region. If you were to go from the coast of the Atlantic Ocean, mm -hmm. where the Amazon Delta mouth is, uh, and you were to go all the way up to Iquitos, is that what two thousand kilometers, or I mean, how yeah, far? That's about, of, that's about a, a thousand miles, so about. 18 okay. kilometers. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so you, it's you, way up the river. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it, you know, the most of the boats take a couple of weeks to get up. You know, that you don't have the big fast boats going from the mouth all the way up to Iquitos. You have these, you know, slow boats that take two weeks to a month to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so do the, um, is cargo shipping uh, conducted all that way as well, too? I mean, is there a port in Iquitos, or are there dams or any obstructions other no, than, like, cataracts? No, dams, no, no dams or obstructions, but what normally happens is cargo comes into Lima. Okay. And then it's trucked out of Lima to one of the river systems. Take You take a boat, a cargo boat, and then you go to a city called Nauta. That is... The only road out of Iquitos leads to Nauta, which is about 50 miles away. And so okay. the, then you have cargo that comes from Nauta by road into Iquitos. Okay. Um, but, you know, it, there, there are some things that come up the mouth from the mouth, but most of it doesn't go through the mouth anymore. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. It's a long, a long trip, I guess. So yeah. Yeah. Um, and also in the chat, you know, I just wanted to comment real quick. I see that, uh, I see a super chat, but I don't want to, um, stop for all the super chats. Don't mean to be rude. I'll try to collect them, but, uh, Leo, thank you very much. And he, they have a question, um, which we'll try to get to, uh, afterwards. So if you could hold your questions for maybe towards the end of when we kind of cover, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mazarel's work uh, down in the Amazon, uh, that would be helpful. But if you guys are wanting to do super chats, honestly, I would really love it if you could go to his link uh, to his center and donate the money to that rather than me tonight. Um, I would just, I would really like that. Um, he's, you know, donating his time here and uh, he's a busy guy. And also just the, the work he's doing is critically important to the ecosystem down there, which is critically important to us having continued access to, to the fish we love and just some things we may never see, but maybe our grandkids will go see. Um, it'd be nice to preserve those things, and that's what he's working on. So uh, if, if you could uh, donate towards his center tonight, I would really uh, rather appreciate that. And then just ask your questions at the end and, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. But thank you so much. I do. I do appreciate yep. that, folks. All right. So uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, That's OK. So uh, so so your center being established in Peru, then, I mean, a lot of people think of the Amazon as kind of this one place, I think. And uh, if you're really into fish, you may know that there's like you said, there's so many different 
uh, ecosystems. And, you know, then there's the Orinoco to the north uh, east and there's, you know, there's cold Andean waters that are like head headwaters from the mountains kind of thing. Um, so as far as diversity goes within the Amazon, I mean, do you find the pockets of like lakes and things right next to each other or is it kind of big regional gradients that, that change over, you know, a, it, a large it, area? It really depends. It depends on the fish. Okay. Uh, you know, some, some of the larger fish have a, a large geographic range, uh, but then some of the smaller fish may, may be found regionally and they can change quite rapidly from place to place. Uh, so it really, it, it really depends. You know, even some of the smaller fish could have long ranges as well. So it just, it's not necessarily the size of the fish. It's really the type of the fish, the behavior, the overall ecology of the fish. Is it, you know, is it a pelagic fish that does it swim in the, in the mid water or is it, you know, stuck on the bottom that you don't see it moving very far from place to place. Which would be ben benthic? Yeah, benthic, yeah. Okay, yep. all right. Yep. I just like to get those words out because sometimes we read them on, you know, care guides and things, and it's nice to know <laughs> the the yep. lingo from time to time, so I appreciate hey, it. You, you know, even locally, there's whitewater, blackwater rivers and streams, and if it's a blackwater stream, or blackwater fish, it's not going to venture into the main stem of the river because then it tends to be less black water. Oh, uh, even yeah. Though it's, even though it's still considered black water, there's still a lot of, of sediments and stuff that are in there that, that make it more white water. Okay. I mean, that that's what's fascinating to me, too, is I know you've done a lot of uh, work and presentations on the, the chemistry of the water, basically, and, and how, mm -hmm. how it all works. Um, but I wanted to, I'll try to stick with your story in order. So you were studying how uh, discus uh, fry spread yeah. out. That that kind of, I mean, that has been a question of mine about all fish in general yeah. is, you know, during the dry season, do they wait until the flood water starts going and then they try to spread their babies? Or do they have a babies before the flood and they get mm -hmm. big enough so that they're safe to spread out? I mean, are there all sorts of different strategies that get Yeah, there's used? all sorts of strategies. For, for discus, what happens is that they are breeding during the flood stage. You know, that brings in a lot of food because all that plant material is breaking down, bacteria, fungi, protozoans. You know, they form an important food base for a lot of the fish. Uh, luckily for discus, they have that parental care where they're feeding off the mucus off the, the parents. So they're getting a head start for at least a couple of weeks. Usually only about a month, a month and a half is when we tend to see baby fish away from the adults. Uh, so they, they are starting to move out a little bit. Uh, but, you know, when it's high water... It's difficult to catch fish because there's so much brush or so much so many plants that it's hard to get in so when you catch fish during high water it's it's normally at the edges of the of the river okay uh, where you know right where the the plant material starts but the problem is that may be 40 50 feet deep where <laughs> yeah. in the where in the dry season you're looking up at that same plant you know you're right. below the root level uh, during dry season Right. So there is there is dramatic flood, you know, differences between high water and low water. In most yeah. Places. I mean, you see those houses on stilts and you see yeah. boats that are just sitting on the shore and it looks like there's no water for a mile yeah. around. You know, um, it's it's very, very interesting as far as as far as how dynamic that environment is or that people could even figure out how to live there is you know, fascinating to me. The The people of the region have always fascinated me as an anthropologist. And um, I've always been kind of curious to ask someone who spent times down there. I mean, what, what do the people think of the ornamental fish? I mean, are they kind of out of sight, out of mind because they're little a lot of times? Or do they eat them if they're meat? I mean, what do they, is there an appreciation or are they not food so they're not interesting? You know, I'm just, I was just curious if there's a, a yeah, general... Yeah. For most people, um, most people know maybe five or six fish species. That's it. You wow. know, there may be 900 species of fish in Peru. About within Iquitos, there's probably over 300 fish 
that are captured for the pet trade. Wow. Unless you're in the pet trade, unless you're a fisherman, and the fishermen normally go out for one fish at a time, you're not going to find someone who goes out like I do with a large thing and collects all the fish. Right. If they're, if they're, if they need angelfish, they'll go out and collect just angelfish. Okay. Or if they're knife fish, they'll collect night fish. But the normal public only knows five or six fish species because those are the fish species that they eat. Okay. And, and in, in reality, by law, if it is a food fish, considered a food fish by the government, it cannot be exported legally out of Peru. Okay. So, like, you know, Tigrinus catfish, that's, that's a black market fish. It hasn't, oh. been exported. it hasn't been exported out of uh, Peru legally in, in at least the last four or five years. Okay. Uh, so, so what, one of the things we do at the research center is uh, we are actually a receiving center from the government with custom seizures. When people try to, the exporters try to illegally export fish out of the country and they're seized by customs, we actually receive those fish. And what we oh, do wow. with those fish is we actually take them back to their native environment. So we're, we're trying to reestablish these populations that are being decimated by the black market. Wow. So, I mean, I'm curious with, with creatures. I mean, a lot of times with apex creatures, like mm -hmm. a grizzly bear or something, it will have a huge range and there aren't that many of them in the range. Yep. So, yep. I mean, are a lot of these big fish that are kind of, taken in the black market as kind of predatory fish or monster fish as they call them do they function that same way in the amazon i mean is there yeah, yeah, only yeah. so there's yeah. only so much food for them to eat yeah. so yeah. there's only so many and when when they harvest maybe they spawn in an area together or something and if they go there and collect them all they're really doing damage to that that run well they're, they're they're primarily catching the babies okay the babies uh, you know the juveniles but you know some of these juveniles stay together for a long time, you know, okay. even without their parents. And they normally collect them at night. Um, you can very easily flashlight them. And when they're, you know, mm. small one, two inch fish, it's nothing to collect a thousand of those a night. Wow. Yeah. You know? And so you could really decimate a population very quickly. Sure. In that way. And so when they, when they're collecting like this, and, and I'll just say in case people are curious, um, of course, uh, part of the, the role of the research center down there is to inform the, uh, I mean, we'll just say uninformed uh, public about the, the best way to collect uh, fish sustainably and which yeah. species are uh, able to be collected sustainably. Um, you know, it's, uh, people have heard of, uh, have heard of piava and the uh, cardinal tetra work, but I mean, that's the fish they work with. They work with the cardinal tetra. So you have 300 fish in your region that are of interest to the hobby. And so that is work that you will be, uh, or that you're there to consult with. Um, yeah, folks you know for. what, uh, Project Piava does great work. There, there's no doubt. Their model is much different than our model. Our model is sustainable breeding. You know, we're not trying to tell the fishermen, hey, don't collect fish. That that's that's unreasonable to say that. Uh, but what we're what we're doing and we're and we're training the fishermen to do is is to during the rainy season when they can't collect fish to breed their own fish so they have a steady income all year long. Um, sure. And so they they don't have to rely so much on collecting and over collecting uh, because there is over collection over collection has decimated the populations there of, of many fish there's scientific studies to show that uh, and so we're, we're trying to say you know take a step back let's see what we can do in ponds and okay. really one of the fish that we're working or one of the groups of fish we're working on are epistogrammas epistogrammas oh yeah very easily breed in ponds Small They're, ponds too. Yeah, small yeah. ponds, and so those are not hard to maintain. Yeah, and, and so you know we're 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 teaching them how to do it, when to do it, and what you know what's the best practices. Sure, and I mean, and another thing is if you can put the the 
the power to the people in the town too. I mean, if, if they can become known, I, like the Czech Republic does this kind of, yep. where, you, where you have collectives of breeders that become known for a certain Episto strain or whatnot. I mean, you can really build a new model of trade for the region. And economically, I'm assuming, I mean, I'd love for people to to hear this. I've read numbers, but I'd like to hear what, what your estimates are or thoughts are. But say someone has a bag of uh, neon tetras or even a pistos or something. If they come in with a you know a, a two kilo bag of a thousand or two thousand fish or something, what are they going to be getting paid? Like what what's their rate versus the U.S. market rate, and how many of those fish end up surviving by the end of the season, anyways? Like I, I was just be really curious to hear. For- uh, it's, it's pennies on the dollar. Okay. So the, the, the fishermen themselves most. The fishermen, there's normally a fisherman collective mm-hmm. that, you know, all the fishermen in that village belong to, and they may sell straight to the exporters, or they may sell to a middleman. It just depends on how far out they are from Iquitos. Mm-hmm. So let's say it's a 10-hour uh, boat ride. They're going to sell to a middleman who has a fast boat that can make it in into Iquitos in an hour. So okay. The, the fishermen, the collectors are using tiny canoes uh, and they may go out for a week or two to collect fish. Okay. Uh, and, and then come back and sell all they can to the middleman. But the, the fishermen are actually making pennies on the dollar, if okay. less than that. Okay. Because I read uh, about six weeks ago, somebody was in... Where were they? They were in Brazil, but I can't recall the town they were in. Uh, they said that people for Neon Tetras, that they were getting $4 per kilo. And that was yeah. about 2,000 fish, four US yeah. dollars. Um, and that's what they were getting for, yeah, 1,000 to 2,000 yeah. Neon Tetras. And they said that on the way to the collection point, half of the fish could have died yeah. Um, yeah. from the remote villages that they yeah. come from. So that's a big difference you're talking about if you raise in a pond and you raise the correct amount for what's being sold, there's mm-hmm. less waste. Yep. Um, so, uh, I mean, for these people, uh, how, how do they get this up and running? I mean, it, the overhead has got to be, I mean, are you looking at methods for keeping the overhead lower or because if you keep fish in the U.S., you would think it'd be pretty expensive to breed 100 apistos. But down there, you've got the free heating, you know, you've got the free mm-hmm. water. Um, so, I mean, does it is it a pretty effective low overhead business model for them? Yeah, there? it's low overhead. Uh, you know, the the biggest cost probably is going to be the man hour cost to okay. build, a, build a pond. Uh, and three men can build up a, a, a small pond, you know, a, a meter, three feet deep by two by two on, you know, square, two meters uh-huh. by two meters. So uh, uh, typically a couple men can do that in three or four days. And then the, since the water table is so high that it just fills naturally up with water. Uh it probably then, filters it pretty good too, yeah, right? The ground. It filters it, it, filters it very well. Okay. And then, you know, you're gonna have plants starting to grow along the edge, brings in insects. You you know, so the biggest cost at that point would be food, but you know, they there's a lot of commercial fish food producers there for the aquaculture industry, so you can get that pretty cheap down there. So really it's just the know-how is the okay. uh, it is the dividing line of those who will do it. They just, they don't, it, it's hard for them to think outside of the box from, you know, my family's been collectors for forever. Yeah. How am I now going to change from being a collector to being a fish farmer? And we're saying, you don't, you don't necessarily have to change. This can be in conjunction with your collection. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's a supplemental model. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, so, I mean, are there are there species that you have in mind targeting in particular? I mean, are there a t- is there a top five or top ten where you're like, man, it would really help the ecosystem if people started fishing X, Y, and Z? Um, 
the some of the epistogrammas. There's a, a, a epistogramma that we actually produce on our uh, on our research facility just to look at the feasibility, and that's epistogramma alto tapici, uh, uh -huh. which is is now it's very rare because it was over collected. Um, so the last remaining populations can be very easily being brought into a pond situation because we do it. We don't even feed our pond. These fish are breeding and living fine just off the insects and the, the other, you know, invertebrates that are living in the pond itself because they're actually living in our reservoir. And the reservoir is, the, is what we use for the water in our, in our aquarium system. So... We don't want to feed the fish. We don't. We don't want to degrade the water in there. So, but they're in there as mosquito control. That's one of our mosquito control fish. Um, wow. So, epistos. Know, yeah, epistos will eat everything. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah no, I was yeah. just surprised because you know here we think of them as these expensive little jewels yeah. of a fish. Yeah. But they're they're your mosquito control. <laughs> that's that's why we put it in. We've tried other fish. That other fish work, but we thought. You know, why not use this fish? Because this is a fish, you know, this is a, a group of fish that we want to be able to be bred in ponds. Yeah. So let, let's try it in our system, see if we can get them to, to breed. And, you know, they're breeding fine. We've sure. Had them in our ponds for a couple of years. So, you know, it, it, without any problems. So I was curious, I mean, coming from the Pacific Northwest, back, a background in the Pacific Northwest of states of Washington, Idaho, Oregon, myself, um, I see the model of salmon that spawn and they, they travel very far and they come back. Same with the whales in our area and, and porpoises and things. Um, are there fish in the Amazon that do that or are they more local? I mean, are most of the species that we collect in the hobby kind of a local, local war or whatever you'd want to call that? Yeah, some some are, but like um, um, Rumminos tetra in uh -huh. Peru, uh, the Rumminos tetra does undertake a migration to spawn oh. as well. Uh, okay. So they're they're going they're coming out of the the small tributaries, you know, to the main river and back. Uh, oh, okay. But, you know, there is a fish that is that they did population genetics work on that showed that the entire Amazon River, from the mouth of the river all the way up to the Andes, is one continuous population. That fish will spawn in one region and migrate all the way up the Amazon. Uh, wow. So, you know, so there are those long distance migrators that we see in just like in the ocean itself. Sure. Sure. Okay. So I, I was just thinking in my head that, you know, trip, fish that undergo a trip like that are a lot more probably uh, exposed to being captured yeah. and, and decimated population wise. Yep. Okay. Um, so I feel like we've kind of hopped around a little bit, but I, I want to also get to your, uh, to your center itself. So, I mean, we, we've talked about it briefly, but so it's a research center it's a model for the public to see how to do uh, things that they are, uh, you know, possibly doing year round instead of collecting fish, yep. you know, partially. It's a place for researchers and scientists to come and do work if need yes. be. Uh, is yep. it a place and, for? And, well, for researchers, uh, we're, our center is such that <clears throat> you don't have to work on fish to come to our research center to stay. You know, we have dormitories that are are open for any scientist who wants to come and be stationed out of Iquitos. But we also, you know, we have research volunteers that come stay with us. We have interns. So if you're interested in, in volunteering or, you know, if you're a college student, and you're looking for an internship, please write us, you know, go to our webpage and, and email me or, or my wife. And, you know, we, we take, we will be taking interns again this summer. We hadn't for the last couple of years because of COVID, but, uh, this summer, uh, we will be accepting interns as well. Um, but as we also are, you know, I've been trying to uh, organize collecting trips, sustainable collecting trips for, for hobbyists uh, for the past couple of years. But because of COVID, we, you know, we couldn't right. do it. But yeah, uh, that's, that's always a possibility of, of groups of people coming down, five or six people staying at the dorms. You know, us organizing the the trip. It would be day trips or night trips. We wouldn't be 
boat based like some of the you know the the bigger uh outfits have it in a uh, but what it does it allows you to to um, go to all the small sites that sometimes when you're on a boat you really can't get to you know we well, I, we work clo we work closely with all the fishermen you know we are the, my uh our uh, resident manager there on the research center uh worked in the aquarium industry for the past 20 years we we hired him away from the largest exporter in Iquitos. He was their general manager. So we hired him away from them. Okay. So he, he knows more. He's forgotten more fish than I, than I know. And so <laughs> he's worked with all the fishermen, you know, so he, you know, he's a valuable resource for us. So we, we need to collect a fish for someone, you know, he'll call somebody up and say, Hey, you know, where to collect these. And then we'll go in to that exact spot and collect them. But yeah, we okay. we would like to we would like to do some some trips for people, even if you're not a collector, want to go see the environment. You know, there's yeah. there's possibilities to do that. Or the uh, birds, or or the yeah. birds, yeah, or or the reptiles, amphibians. You know, we don't do spiders because I don't like spiders. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not fond of them either. Yeah, I've eaten spiders, but uh, you know, I'm they're not something I want to play with. I, I can I can understand that and that you know. But I do also understand the interest in ants and, you know, bees and yeah. things. But yeah, 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 things that sting or bite, I, I'd rather avoid also, yeah. you know, and uh, that, you know, that's a really cool thing because, you know, Yvonne had asked me, hey, Alex, why don't you just come down to Venezuela? We just have to come to Colombia and then we'll get on a boat and then in about five days we'll be where we need to be. And I'm someone who has to have a refrigerator for their you know, uh, injectable medications and their EpiPens. And so as much as I really do want to be like I was when I was 20 and get off the trail and have a machete and be going through the yep. woods, realistically, that time has probably passed for my health, uh, especially since I broke my back uh, three years ago. So, I mean. Our, our, our dormitories are, are well equipped. I, I'm, I wanted to make them comfortable for mm -hmm. American scientists. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I I will tell you we're spoiled. You know, as American <laughs> scientists. Oh yeah. We're used, we're used to our air conditioner. We're used to our hot and cold running water. Where you know most of the people there don't need air conditioners. Right. do you know cold shower is just good enough for them if they even have running water. So uh, so our dorms are we have an air conditioner in each. Oh room. wow. A ceiling fan, if you don't want to run the air conditioner, you know, every dorm has their own bathroom that has hot and cold running water. We have a, a, a laundry on site where it's a washer and a dryer. A dryer is not very easily found in Iquitos. Uh, we found the only one at a store that they had that was the <laughs> only one in Iquitos. And, and, you know, we have a kitchen that's well-stocked dining room area. So, you know, it, it's a comfortable place to go to. Uh, so you, only, you get things dry and then the humidity soaks them about 10 yeah. minutes later? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, you have to know that as soon as you walk outside, no matter what time of year it is, it's going to be 95 to 100 percent humidity. Okay. And that's, you know, that's uh, w whereas I'm sitting there working and I'm sweaty. My Peruvian friends and Peruvian co-workers, they don't have a bead of sweat on them. Right. They're, they're just used to it. So I can't, you know, it's like I'm drowning. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm more of that that camp also. Yeah. Uh, um, so, that I mean, that sounds really neat. And that's so if people are interested in in contacting you about coming down for a trip or they're a scientist, a fellow ichthyologist or biologist or, you know, ecologist, whatever, some sort of ologist, <laughs> yep. uh, would they just contact you through their website or, uh, yeah, what's the, what's the best my, way to go? My, my email, uh, at the research center is a maze. That's a M A Z E at, uh, Amazon research center.org. Um, okay. you know, they, they can also email me at my university. You know, it doesn't really matter where they contact me. Uh, you know, okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. Me. Yeah. You know, and one, of, All right. one of the great opportunities for interns is that uh, hopefully by June, we'll have opened up our public aquarium. 
And that's really right. our major push right now is to get the public aquarium finished. Um, in, because that's going to be a, a great educational tool for uh, the, the people of Iquitos. So, you know, we're, we'll have school kids coming through, uh, you know, tours for them, for the school system, you know, tours for anybody who wants to come. Uh, and, and we're going to showcase, you know, some of the food fish, of course, uh, and a lot of the other fish that they normally don't see. And we'll even have a room yeah. for nocturnal fish. So we're going to oh, have a cool. dark room where you go in and you'll see all the small fish that only come out at night. Which, That's you know, great. Most places, most especially small places, won't aren't going to have that. No, and that I was, mean that was actually a, a last minute idea. We took our little, uh, um, what was going to be our gift shop, and decided that room instead of being a gift shop would be a nocturnal room for nocturnal fishes. Oh, that's brilliant. I love that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, do you uh, do you have by any chance any do we have any images of the place we could show folks? Um, I do have handy? some images. If it's not handy, then don't worry about it. But I, if if uh, if you wanted to share some of those, I'm just I'm just trying to sell this idea to, to get folks to go down there and support your center, sure. because I mean, what a great spot to be. Uh, a touchstone point for the public, the indigenous people that have suffered a long time down there for various reasons. And then now, I mean, it's a recent transition to the modern global economy in some ways. I mean, in other ways, trade routes have been plugged in since the conquistadors. But I mean, yep. in, in other, in a more, you know, uh, practical manner, they've been living life uh, a certain way for a long time. Uh, and here we go. All right. So, that must oh, be the campus right there. That's the campus. Can you see my arrow? I'm not sure if you can see my arrow. Um, I don't see it right. That's, that's okay. I, I, I mean, don't see it, unfortunately. Everything is labeled, so it's easy. Yeah. So, you know, you you can see the office and lab, and that's just, you know, our, our office that we have. And uh -huh. half of it, well, a third of it's office, then the back two-thirds is an instrument lab where we have, you know, basic um, laboratory equipment, microscopes, uh things of that sort that, you know, anybody would, would need if they're uh, going to be working down there. Uh, the big building is the, the wet lab, the fish lab. That is a dual purpose uh, area. This is where we bring in all fish to, uh, to quarantine them before we'll put them in the public aquarium. It's also a place that people put fish that they're working on. Uh, we had uh, this past summer, uh, Eric Thomas from the University of Pacific, Oh he sure, he on, yeah he works he's on the, self poisoning. Uh, yeah, of, uh, Corey Doris. He actually came down and spent two weeks there uh, working on the Corey Doris that uh, the local Corey Doris on self poisoning, um, and and so you know we're open to have people there. There's large raceways in there. There are you know small tanks in there. So uh, uh, whole sorts of of equipment and and aquarium stuff that you yeah. can use inside the, the wet lab. Uh, and so, the, you know, that's the largest really, besides the public aquarium, the largest building on site because that's where my work takes place as well. So uh, what billionaire but, built this incredible facility? Um, no billionaire. <laughs> uh, a, a lot of uh, small donors, which we, you know, greatly appreciate, uh, you know, as well as money that comes from other sources. Uh, sure, you know. but but my point being is that this is a really cool thing, and it depends on folks who care about fish, the environment, yeah. the hobby, and and people who come down. So, yeah. if you're interested, or if you are looking for something to donate to, or maybe for the holidays, somebody you know you want to donate in honor of, uh, <clears throat> this guy right here has an organization that uh, I've looked into you know, and followed for a while. And, and I would say is a great choice. So, uh, you know, just going to throw that do, out there. We do have naming opportunities. You know, if this wanted to be the Alexander Williamson public aquarium that, you know, that would take, you know, 50, 60,000, it'll be yours. So, you know, yeah. You name, uh, you have your name, go to one of the aquariums inside. Um, and I'll show you the aquariums inside in a, in a bit to show now, you what, what the public aquarium is like. 
Now, could you name like a nematode or something like that after me for like three or four bucks? I mean, do uh, there are other opportunities. Uh, maybe fly mold. There's a okay. local fly mold that, that would have your name right on it. All right, all right. It's kind of a, a, a kind of a a whitish brown slime mold that has all these uh, hairs projecting all over the place. That's, oh yeah, that's, that's great. That's me, pasty white with hairs projecting all over the place. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So you can just see our dorms. We have four four dorm rooms, double or, or triple occupancy. We we had to make a choice. Uh, either make our dorms two story, uh, so we'd have eight to ten rooms, or build the public aquarium first. So we decided to build the public aquarium first because, after all, I'm an educator, uh, and I think the education of the kids and the public is really more important than having more people stay on the dorms. Uh, Definitely. So. You know, we made that decision. My wife and I made that decision uh, four or five years ago that that's where we had put our money in to begin with. Uh, but there are plans to to add a second floor to the dorm. So that would be an additional four to six more dorm rooms there because we'd go on top of the kitchen and dining room area as well. Oh, OK. So somebody just asked, and, and I'm curious, too. They said, how much would I need to donate to come down and check out this facility? Uh, how much would you need to donate? Uh, you would actually not need to donate anything in reality. Uh, if you wanted to come, we have a three-week minimum stay for our interns or volunteers. You come to the research center, work there, uh, and stay there. You get free room, free board. We Oh, we wow. feed you and we house you. We don't pay you. You are a volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or if you're a college student, an intern, you know, they're ba both basically the same thing. It's just. Depends, sure. <laughs> you know, yeah. What, Formality. What age is. Yeah. yeah. Formality. You know, college students want internships. They don't want to be called a volunteer. So, uh, you know, there are things of that sort. So th that's well, you could do it. You know, if you would feel. If you feel like you would want to uh, want to donate while you're there or before you're there, we would be happy to take your donations. You know, every penny counts for us. Uh, we, we have no corporate donors at all. It's all coming from, um, you know, the public. That That's where we get our, our donor from. We do have kind of a corporate. There are some companies who have matching donations. Uh, and so, you know, we do get some uh a few matching donations from companies, but it's not like the company is coming out and seeking us. You know, we would love to have a, a corporate donor, uh, but you know, we're, we're happy so far with, with the small donors, small, I mean, public donors that we, we, we've been able to, to get over the past five or six years. Well, that, I think that's great because I mean, one, it allows you to be, you know, kind of pivot on your feet quickly. You don't have to ask for permission or anything, you know? Yeah. And, and you're not beholden to anybody uh, as far as, oh, well, we wanted to do this, but they're paying for it. So what do we do, you know? Because yeah. um, yeah. on the ground, things change quickly. I mean, look at look at the yeah. pandemic unfolding. I mean, yeah, yeah, that had to change all your plans right at the last minute. So And well, ma yeah, material it, costs for that matter. Material costs have gone up considerably. I, I will tell you a story about the pandemic. Um, when the pandemic hit the U.S. that spring, my wife and I were planning to fly to Iquitos during my spring break, which is, you know, mid-March. The night we, before we were going to fly out, we decided, you know, let's not go. Let's just see what happens. Well, two days later in Peru, they completely closed their borders. You could not get out of the country. And yeah. so we would have been stuck there for two to three months at least. Uh, and, you know, after after a time, the American government came in and said, OK, we'll we'll have these flights out of out of Peru, but you have to find your way to Lima. Well, you know, yeah. there was no more internal flight, so it would have taken us a long time to get to Lima and hopefully we get a flight out. So we were lucky that we didn't go. So, you know, there there are. You know, this is a developing nation there. It's out in the middle of nowhere. The only way you can get into Iquitos is take the river or you fly it. There, there are really, you know, no roads outside of that one road that goes 50 miles away that leads into Iquitos. It, it's an island in the Amazon. And now how many people are in Iquitos, by the way? 
Uh, Quito's itself has a, a an actual well uh, on on the on general record, serviceable has, area. Yeah, yeah. It has about five to six hundred thousand people, but but what's happening is people are moving from the villages into a Quito's, uh, thinking there's there's more opportunity for work, and they're squatting on open land, and uh, there's a. A, a law in Peru that if you show reasonable use of land um, and it, it's not protected by guards or anything, you have a right to that land. And in fact, we lost a third of our land of the research center because overnight a guy built his house on our land. Holy cow. The local government said, well, you know, he has a house there. It's now his land. And so that made us what we had to do is we had to build a brick wall around our facility not, wow, not because you, you know not necessarily because we're afraid someone's going to come in and steal stuff we were afraid that people were going to come squat on our land wow that's and, that's and really that, interesting <laughs> yeah yeah and and so you know you can prevent that but to prevent that you have to have police guards surrounding your land 24 hours a day which costs a lot of money I was going to say, you got to give yeah. someone a, a hefty tip to have that happen, I'm yeah. sure. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting. So, let me, so as I was, you know. Yeah, you take it this, from here. I'm yeah. sure, I'm sure you can just kind of explain yeah. things from here. I'll just sit back and uh, I'll put you on the screen. I don't, I don't even need to be sure. there. So, you know, this, this is earlier, very early on uh, when we were, you know, thinking about the research center, uh, showing, you know, three of our workers just building a pond and you can see the water in that pond and that, that water just infiltrates naturally once you get down below the clay layer, uh, which is not very deep, but the, the, the dirt in this area is actually white sand. It's, it's considered a white sand uh, rainforest. Uh, so once you get below the organic layer, which may be only one or two feet deep at, at most, you have this pure white sand, um, and that's the same sand that you find in the river systems as well. Uh, and, you know, over collection is, is what we're concerned with. Uh, here's a, a fisherman that was collecting um, some of the small catfish for the pet industry. Uh, and this is what they do. They collect them by the thousands. Uh, we, they also over collect for food. Uh, here's a fisherman. This is what the, the little fishy boats look like. But uh, these plecos were actually destined for the, the marketplace. They make a soup out of the plecos uh, as a seasoning because there's really not much meat in the pleco besides uh, the, the eggs when the females are ripe. Uh, and this is the, the guy on the right or the left is Roberto, one of the, the local fishermen that we went out one day with him. And he was actually collecting just angelfish. Uh, so again, they collect one fish at a time you know, whatever is needed in those exporters tanks, that's what they'll go out and collect. This is one of the fish that has been over collected in, in the Iquitos region in the Rio Nanay, and, and that is the uh, Camellia Laura Carid. Um, they, they are hefty price even uh, from the exporters, uh, but the fishermen, you know, the fishermen may get one or two dollars a piece, which is really great money for uh, the fishermen. And so what they do is they try to collect as much as they can. Economics says the more you provide, the lower the price gets. And and so what they have to do, they have to go over collect more. Uh, and so it's they can't find the balance between collection and the good stable price. We, you know, one of the things we're working with is um, the we work with the IUCN looking at oh, looking at some of the uh, um, uh, red listed fish. There are two red listed fish in Iquitos um, in the surrounding area. That's the red pencil fish, the same red pencil fish that we have in the hobby. Uh, it has been substantially over collected in the area and it's on the IUCN uh, critically endangered list. Uh, and, and so there's no regulation on how much, how many of these things can come out of Peru. And this summer, hopefully we'll be 
we will be working on this fish. We brought him into the research center to, to look at the feasibility of how or can they be raised in pond situations. Uh, we don't know yet. We, you know, we, we got ours in August, so we'll wait until June after the rainy season to see if our numbers increase and how many they actually increase. So we, we put in 50 uh, fish into a pond, 50 males, 50 females, we're just not sure what the right sexual ratio will be uh, and see what happens. Another fish is this small uh, killifish, Anablepoides uh, speciosus. They say it's over collected, but if you look at the collection records, there's been no more than 100 fish that have ever been exported out of, out of Iquitos. So this is a fish that's truly uh, man caused in terms of habitat loss uh, because of the the building of, of these new settlements. There's no, um, you know, there's no um, sanitation facilities. Open sewage systems goes into some of these streams and some of these swampy areas where this fish lives. Did I screw up here? All right. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Did I screw up Alex? Uh, I don't think so. Can you hear me though? Yeah, I can hear you. So let, let me. Okay. Yeah. You pull that back up and I can, I can uh, set it back up. It's no big deal. Okay. So I, I pulled it. Okay. There you go. All okay. right. All right. Let's so, see here. So again, you know, our, our main thing is environmental education. Um, Alex is, is helping us in our environmental education. I'm glad he put that in his note when he announced this. So we do have a, uh, a parasitic relationship between us. <laughs> Get it, parasite. That was my bad uh, science joke. Uh, Alex is will be helping us with our environmental education, working on our our, our mascot uh, Nalda, which is means strength in uh, Spanish. Uh, she's going to be our mascot. Um, he's also helping us with our uh, coloring books for the research center for the kids. You know, teach them environmental education while they're ha while they're having fun. Um, and here are some of the kids who who come to the research center in the past, even before we uh, had the aquarium. Uh, wow, so that's that's thing, great to see so many kids. Is, yeah, it really is. It, it's aquarium of the Amazon. Again, we have a naming rights. It can be you know. Uh, right now, it's, you know, Anthony Masro Aquarium of the Amazon, but that doesn't look very good in Spanish. So uh, <laughs> it's right now, it's just the Aquarium of the Amazon. Uh, this, when you walk into the aquarium, uh, one of the things you'll do is you'll walk underneath this tunnel tank, we call it. So th this is Aldo. He is um, well, our main construction guy. He's typical size for... Uh, a uh, typical Peruvian, he's about five foot four. Uh, so Peruvians tend to be a, a little bit uh, shorter than most Americans. So the top of this is six feet tall. So I have a wow. grandson who's, who's six eight. He's probably not going to be able to go under there. But it'll give the kids and the and people in the area a different perspective of, of the fish that they're looking at. Uh, you know, we've all been to public aquariums that they've had that, you know, the tunnel that goes through the, the aquarium that's all you know that surrounds you we're we're trying to give that effect here on a much more smaller scale uh and if you uh wrong way so this is actually looking through that tunnel tank so we're we're inside that tank to uh my right to your right is a series of, of large tanks that will be filled with um you know piranha catfish uh, all sorts of some of the larger fish. The cement tank in front of you is a touch tank, but you can't touch these fish. This will be filled with all the local stingray species, so the people will be able to see the stingrays from the top. Oh, cool. um, you know, there's probably eight to ten different stingray species, some that are not found in the hobby at all, but I think are probably the, some of the more spectacular stingrays. Uh, we know oh, now wow. that stingrays are, are CITES protected, so they're, they're much more difficult to actually export out of the country, but black market is still exporting them. The yeah. brown tank here is a tank that is six feet wide, six feet long, and um, 
four and a half feet tall. Um, <laughs> this is a tank that's going to have a in the right in the center of the tank. There'll be a large tree trunk, uh, and it will be filled with uh, wild discus, wild angelfish, and some of the quarry species, and a, and a few tetras. So it's going to, uh, to me, that's the centerpiece tank. You know. Yeah, they'll I'm, circle around. That'll be yeah. incredible. I'm, you know, I'm a discus addict. Our, you know, our <laughs> logo is a discus. I, I have a. Many people don't know this, but I actually have a, a discus tattoo on my on my shoulder. <laughs> so I've always loved discus. Uh, and so that, you know, I want that to be our show tank. But it's going to be one of the lesser show tanks because all the way in the back, you can see that glass panel that's actually an acrylic panel that is 20 feet wide whoa and six feet tall so this will be for some of the the larger larger fishes in the area we will not have arapima uh we are we work with another group uh called amazon forever who they have a large outside tank that they have arapima in now so we don't really want to duplicate what what they are doing so there's no reason for us to have arapima since they have arapima, which is fine with me. You know, arapima are great, uh, but, you know, you don't necessarily need to have them in every aquarium in the area. Uh, the, uh, on the opposite side, on the, on the left-hand side, will be the tank right next to the, the, the large uh, tank is actually going to be a tank for electric rays. We have, I'm not electric rays, electric eels, which are actually knife fish. Uh, and so we have some large uh, electric eels already on site that will be put in the uh, the display itself. And, and we're, I'm going to set it up where you can push a button and you can actually hear the electrical clicks of the, uh, of the electric eels. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Click. Yeah, they click, 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 just to find their environment, to look around their environment because their eyes are tiny. They're usually found in very dark stained water, so the eyes don't do them any good. Oh, so they're like mormorids kind of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that ex exactly. Um, and we, we may have someone coming this coming summer who actually works on uh, electric eels for his research. Oh, wow. Uh, so we're... You know, he's not sure what's going to happen during the summer. He's still trying to find students to carry on the research with him. But we've, we've been in talks with him about coming. And then the other tanks are just tanks with, with for some of the smaller fish species uh, in the area. Uh, so this is just one portion of the, the aquarium itself. But, you know, it's going to bring a lot of education to this area. And, and that's what it's there for. It's not there to make money because we're not going to make money off of it. It's it's there to educate the people, to educate the public on what they're doing to their environment, what we can do to help, you know, save our environment, so to speak, and what what it means for them in the future if we don't do anything to 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 help preserve that ecosystem that they all take for granted. As, sure. as outsiders, we look at it as like, oh my gosh, this is the Amazon. You got to remember, these people live there. They, they, that's where they get their food. That's where they get their livelihood. They don't necessarily look at it like we do. You know, so, at, so yeah, I mean, are there are there portions of the river near there that are just decimated already, like that that, that they can see, or is it not to that point yet? You know, where uh, there well, there are uh, there are parts of the river that are basically a trash bin. Yeah. Uh, you, you have to realize, you know, for generations, they didn't have paper bags. They didn't have plastic bags. Everything came in a banana leaf. That, you mm -hmm. know, that was, their, that was their bag. And what do you do with a banana leaf? Well, you throw it on the ground because that's going to decompose. And so yeah. that, that mindset is still there. And so, um, you know, you find plastic bags, you find plastic bottles all over the place. When the rains come, this all gets washed into the river. And there's portions of the river where this trash collects. Uh, you yeah. know, some of the back, the Oxbow Lakes, you know, are just covered with trash. It's like the, you know, the big Pacific. Um, oh, the, the trash patch. garden yeah. gyre. Yeah. yeah. That, that That's what it's like in some of these areas, you know, and, and we're. 
we're we're trying to show those you know show the kids especially the kids because that's that's how you change the hearts of the people as you you know change the kids uh you know there there is a better way to do this well that's why hopefully yeah we're, that's we're there that's why I want to help with this. And, you know, as an artist, I feel like, well, I could at least help you with that part of it. You know, um, you know, art's always fun. So, yep. Yep. So that's, <laughs> well, this is because, we, you know, we are trying to combat the, the uh, black market fish trade. And I've talked about it, you know. Uh, so here's a stingray that was uh, meaning to be exported uh, that we have in the facility. Wow. Again, here, here are the stingrays. I mean, our, our stingrays. I don't like Elect that on my brain. Electric eels. Uh, we we have like seven or eight of them. They're, they were confiscated, not because they were illegal to export. They're perfectly legal. But they were in a box. On the top of the box were the electric eels. Underneath them were thousands of catfish. Oh. Uh, Tigrinus catfish. Uh, yeah. The, the giant... Uh, Brachypletostomata that you know gets to six eight feet. They're all illegal to export, but this person was trying to export them, and, and so we actually have them in our facility to you know to release back into the wild. So what is driving this illegal black market? I mean, obviously people buying things, but is it yep. the U.S.? Is it Asia? Is it Europe? I mean, is there a place or, or a, a a trend that that's really most of the problem out of there? Um, it, these were actually destined for the U S you, you okay. look on aqua bid, you look on, you know, a lot of places, you know, monster fish are still the thing to have. Well, even if they weren't illegal, these are fish that aren't meant for captivity. You know, these, especially this fish here, Brachypelostomata, you know, oh, it, gets, wow. it gets the four, five feet long. In fact, in, in the past, you know, you would have six, seven footers. This, this fish doesn't belong to the hobby. There are certain fish that should, in my opinion, should not be sold because most people don't have the ability to care of them after they're two or three feet long. I mean, that's what that's what keeping the Ohio fish rescue in business in Ohio is people have these big fish they don't know what to do with. You know, luckily he, if you're on the East Coast, he will get the fish for you. But as a hobbyist, what do you do to with your red-tailed catfish when you have it in a 55-gallon tank and it's now three feet long? You know, you, there's only a couple options you have. One is hopefully your fish store will take it back. They don't want it. What are they mm. going to do with it? So what what do you have? What's the other alternative? The other alternative is to kill it. And, you know, yeah. I know most of our fish in the hobby will end up dying. Most of it's by neglect or some other stupid act, or in some cases, just old age. But a fish like you know red-tailed catfish, you're 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 gonna have to kill it. You yeah, know? And, and or put it in a local lake or something stupid. Yeah. Well, see, I you know uh, that that's really bad. My research in Akitos, my own scientific research, is looking at invasive species in the Amazon. That is so uh, fascinating so, to me because I just I, you know. Yeah, that never yeah. occurred to me, but of course they're there. It's paradise for fish. So, you know, it makes sense yes. that they're there. But in my head, I always think of, oh, well, it's the Amazon. It's the crazy crowded place where nothing would survive because right. there's competition. But, no, of course. Yep. It's so what are the yep. big species um, other than, you know, just like ornamental discus released from like Brazilian ornamentals being released up in Peru. I mean, what other kind of, uh, other than uh, South American fish, what are the big invasives? I mean, are people releasing tilapia and no. other? Well, um, the, the number one invasive in and around Iquitos right now is blue grommy. Oh. Believe it or not. Blue grommy are there by the billions. Wow. Uh, there, was, there was a fish farm in uh, the 70s that went out of business. <laughs> He walked away from the business, and when the floods came, it flooded his ponds, and they went into the river. So he, he was raising about 10, 15 different species from outside of the Amazon, uh, barbs, you know, bettas, uh, sword tails. But the only thing that survived were blue grommies, and, you know, they're, they're there by the billions. They're all over the place in, in the Keats. In fact... They are being used, they were being used 
in the aquaculture industry as live food for arapima farmers <laughs> and and when we when when you know after i presented to the government uh, about this work they decided okay we're going to institute a law that says you cannot feed arapima grammys anymore but any environmental law is only as good as it's being enforced and that's not actually being enforced right and there's there's a problem with that in that the grammys breed and really populate the open sewage canals oh so they have like a thousand babies all, too yeah and they're picking up all those parasites all the viruses all the bacteria they're being fed to a fish oh. that's going to end up as food fish well or are, are is there transfer in humans from those parasites? Because you know a lot of the arpima is used for sushi. But, sure. You know, they don't they don't call it sushi, but there there is a you know uh, there's there are a local dish. There. Yeah, the ceviche local dish. It's it's cooked in in lemon juice, but does it break down the cyst in some of these parasites? So right, you know, that's and I mean concern. And if you have if you have water with a pH of three, I mean lemon juice might not yeah. <laughs> be <Yeah>. enough. <laughs> so yeah, but yeah. we also have guppies. Guppies are brought all into all over the world for yeah. mosquito control. Yeah, you know I've done work. I've done work to show that uh, in areas that should have killifish, if there's guppies, there's no killifish. Oh. In areas that don't have guppies, there are killifish. And it, my students and I worked on a project a few years ago bringing uh, some of the guppies and killifish into the lab. And when when killifish and guppies live together, the killifish are much more active in the water column. Yeah. It, it, it's almost, I've, you would think, well, that's certain, no more behavior because guppies act as a dither fish, which is a fish that makes other fish feel comfortable. But when, if you look at these killifish in the wild, they're always hiding under leaf litter. That is their normal behavior to be in the leaf litter. So in tanks that had no guppies, they were in the leaf litter. And once we completed the project, I just kept the tanks running with no fish. In the tanks that had killifish, we had babies. In the tanks with guppies and killifish, there were no babies at all. So the guppies so are eating the, the babies or the was it stress? The eating the babies. The, either stress, the guppies were eating the babies, or the guppies were eating the eggs. So somehow okay. there was interference between the guppies. But yeah, I've, did I've never, too, yeah, I've never gotten them to breed in, in together. And and yeah. I combine a lot of fish. I breed a lot of yeah. different fish together. But but as you say, I've never gotten those two to successfully like blue yeah. galaris or you know anything like that. I've never yeah. gotten. Them. And and as you mentioned, lastly, we we do we are seeing now tilapia. Tilapia oh, are, have been brought in for aquaculture, but people there don't like to eat tilapia. Mm -hmm. And so they're actually being brought in for the arapima farms as a okay. live food fish. And we, we have found environmental DNA for, for um, tilapia in the native waters. And now we're starting to see the, the tilapia in the streams in the area. So it's a matter of time before they're just found throughout the Amazon. And we know tilapia are going to be devastating. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that literally cut the biodiversity in half in some of the Rift Lake regions. Yep. I mean, it, yep. it's, man, that, that is a bummer. Um, so the thing I want to stop you real quick and mention too, is you have a great series that, that you kind of uh, curate and facilitate online. You had just a phenomenal uh, gal speaking on eDNA specifically, yep. um, which is environmental DNA. We've talked about that on the show, on the channel a little bit, but that is the incredible new uh, technology that allows you to sample, say, a liter of water and find all the various uh, life forms in it by sequencing yep. strands of DNA that are relevant. Um, but she went over it in in detail, and so could you tell us a little bit about that series when it starts up? What it what sure. what's what, what uh, got that going? It's uh, the series is called Talk with the Experts. Uh, you know, there was I, I'm a member of our local fish club, and during COVID, you know we we weren't having fish clubs meeting. We weren't even meeting on Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. 
And so it, it was it was born out of my frustration of trying to find good content uh, that I thought other people would enjoy as well. And I, I must say, Alexander, I didn't discover your your uh, channel until later. So if I would have probably have seen your channel, I probably would have never started it. Uh, but <laughs> we bring, you know, we 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 have brought in uh, hobbyists, we have brought in scientists to talk about various as various as aspects of conservation when it comes to aquarium fishes. Uh, our next talk uh, is December eighteenth, hopefully. Uh, which will be a Saturday, December 18th, and we'll have Les Kaufman, uh, who's a professor from the University of Boston or Boston University, talk about uh, conservation of African Rift Valley fish, primarily cichlids. Uh, and so, you know, next year we'll have uh, people from the Albuquerque Aquarium talk about uh, some of the work they're doing with some of the native fishes uh, of the, the West, Southwest. Oh, that's um, great. There's like the, yeah. the Gila or Gila trout and all yeah, sorts Gila of trout, pup, yeah. pup, Gila pup fish. Yep. Yeah. 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 So they're, they're doing some restoration work. We, you know, we also uh, in October had someone from the Gadead working group and who's, who worked on the projects of reintroducing these uh, Mexican Gadeads back into their native range you know, places that they've been extirpated from. Uh, so we're trying to highlight a lot of, you know, fish species, fish groups that are of interest to, to aquarists. That are That's great. To, well, know, and I mean, not. yeah. And, and that, that what's great is that people in their clubs or even on their own, they can take these cares species or these IUC yep. or IUCN species that are red listed and maybe in the hobby and available locally breed them. Breed them and yeah. keep a line of them. I mean, I do it for posterity. I, I have a couple friends, uh, you know, Lawrence Kent. I don't know if you know him at all, yeah. but he, I know the name. Yeah. He, he's somebody who goes and collects fish and, and he has uh, one, but uh, uh, he has a species that hasn't been described yet. And so he said, uh, hey, would you, and I was going to say, could I maybe get some of those fish? But before I could say it, he said, would you please try to breed these? And uh kind of be my backup in case you know my tanks go down yep. and so there's a lot of people out there that actually have something like that um uh david uh resnick also for that matter has a bunch of live bears where he was yep. like yep. do you want some live bears because i yep. don't know what to do with them and i am the last yep. one with this strain or that strain so yep. it's yep. sad how many are literally down to one or two people in, in and that's going to be it if we don't keep it going as hobbyists. So, but um, I'll piggyback off something that you had the other night. Uh, oh yeah, talking sure. About what's the difference between you know fish being raised in Asia and fish in America, and why do we go for the Asian fish? You know, unfortunately, we want the best value. Yeah. And, and with a lot of these fish, the best value isn't the best fish. You know, there there's yeah, a reason yeah. why. You know, domestically bred fish tend to be more expensive, or even European fish, than than some other fish, because you know they're they're breeding quality fish with quality fish. They're not breeding fish with fish. They're they're look, trying to produce the best fish possible. You know, and that that that's one of the things you have to worry about when you're introducing fish back to the wild is you're you're trying to get the best fish you just don't want to put any fish so there's a large protocol that you must go through to try to reestablish populations you know they have to be disease free that there's a, a long list of protocols that must you know must happen. sure so it's not like you can breed you know wild guns and take them back to trinidad and tobago and you know <laughs> put them back in there even though they don't have a problem with them but you know i was gonna say they, they've done that basically <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> unintentionally that's what's happened there it, yeah exactly um yeah it, it's uh no i appreciate you saying that because yeah there's there's definitely and and also uh you know quality to me is where 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 value or or value is kind of like where quality and price meet on a graph you know at the at the maximum of each and for me that has to bring ethics into play and yeah. 
we have to be informed consumers. And once you have more than just a, a tank with your kids, uh, you know, in your kid's bedroom with a couple guppies or whatever, uh, if you're someone with a fish room, I, I feel like it's your duty and responsibility to, to kind of uh, delve into these issues and, and try to make an informed yeah. decision and maybe not buy uh, a Pleco that's $30 if you can't source it, if there's no transparency where it came from yeah. and it might be black market versus spending the 45, I mean, a lot of times it's, it's like a negligible difference to make a huge difference in stopping an entire black market or, you know, an inbred line that keeps getting sold out of some country or whatnot. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I, I so, you know, and I don't mean to sound preachy, you know, we've all done things in our lives. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know, that yeah. we're not proud of. But, you know, I, I'm i 61 years old now. I, I, I Hopefully I've learned a few things in my life. And I, I would, you know, as an educator, I like to pass those things on and try to, you know, what I tell my students, the worst thing that can happen from your education is that you come out of your education thinking exactly like me. I, I don't want you to think like <laughs> me. I want yeah. you to be informed and I want you to be able to think for yourself. And we all have to think what's the best for ourselves. You know, what I may think is good for the hobby may not be what you is, think is good for the hobby. But, right. you know, we all we all want the same thing. We all want to keep the hobby going. And, well, you know, and that's as a hobbyist and as a scientist, that that's my goal. And, and what you've done to underline all that in bold is – you've you've highlighted the most important thing which is transparency with education and you're giving us that with your center and uh that's why i think it's such a great cause for people to support and so i mean i really really would like I appreciate uh, that. channel members if you're thinking of giving to a charitable cause in the hobby this this uh season really i mean check out their website look for yourself check out the other things that he's done uh that uh, Dr. Mazarel's done and that the speeches he's given, he's gone to clubs for years, but I mean, every speech, uh, I've seen a number of his speeches and he never preaches, I do this, so you should do that. It's always, well, there's different ways to do things. Here's what the science says about this and about this. You make the decision on on what you think you should do, um, but this is the reality of, of you know, the data. And uh, I think that's where science and education, that should be our role. And I don't have all the answers either, <laughs> very clearly. And that's why I have people like uh, Dr. Anthony Maserol on. So thank you so much, um, doctor. Uh, no if, if it's okay, could we open it up for a few questions and then kind of wrap things up here? We could open it up for a hundred questions. Okay. All right. Well, let's, uh, are you done with this slideshow or do you want me to leave this up? Do oh yeah. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. No worries. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. All right. No worries. Oh, no worries. Oh, there you are. Back, back, big and bold. All right. So does uh, anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Uh, uh, Anthony, uh, my name is Anthony, by the way. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can call me Anthony. I'm, you're not my student, so you can call me Anthony. I, I learned a lot from you, though. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. All right. Let's see. The chat legs behind a little bit, too. So, and uh, we, no had, we had we uh, had a member join, and we also had uh, a couple folks um, give more super chats. But again, please, no more super chats. Just give it to the center if you were going to give it to me tonight. Uh, if you want to be a member or something, it's only a buck ninety nine, and I'm just trying to curate more uh, talks like this. And there's fluffy material on my channel. There's other junk too, but um, really, I want to curate the best knowledge and information that's out there in the hobby and bring it to you from all different angles of the scientific world, basically. So, and I, I want to say we we are a certified nonprofit, five hundred one three C. You know, so. Oh. We tax right by, off <laughs> tax right off we abide by all the government standards and you know we we go above and beyond what we should do because you know why we're we're just that my wife and i are very honest and maybe we're honest to a fault sometimes but you know what <laughs> we don't have to worry about someone knocking on our door the government knocking on our door and saying you know what are you doing yeah. here you know we 
we're we're up we're above board here that's great i mean and that's hard to do in a developing nation oftentimes yeah. i mean because the rules can change at that yeah. knock on the door <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. so <laughs> um so uh, i have a question here which says how close are we to having a water test to detect parasite dna um and is that in regards to discus uh, in particular discus talk or were you just saying in general because we can do that in general um but I'll, I'll let you answer that too. Well, yeah, well, we Anthony. can do that in general with, with environmental DNA, you know, yeah. catching water. But it's not something that as hobbyists we can, we can do. Yeah, a little pricey. Um, you know, so, you know, it, we're, we're a long ways from that. You know, I, I would tell anybody if, if you're really, you know, if you're going into the hobby full force, you know, invest in a, a, a decent microscope. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you can find decent microscopes for three, four hundred dollars. You know, that that's a price of a, an expensive fish at times, you know, even though we think, oh, I can't spend that much on a fish. But if you have a fish die, what do you do with it? When, when one of your fish dies, you just toss it in the trash, put it in the garden. Well, you know, figure out why it died. Uh, yeah. Cut open its stomach. Look at its liver. Look at its in, intestinal tract. See if there's any parasites on the gills. Uh, you, you know, just a few simple things would actually help in the long run prevent things from happening. Yeah. Well, and not to mention, you said one fish could easily cost near that, which is true. But think of all your fish dying in like a yeah. hundred and twenty yeah. gallon tank. You're going to lose yeah. thousands of dollars of fish. Um, yep. yeah, definitely. Um, so we have another question too. We have a lot of people thanking you and saying what a great talk. So, I mean, I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. Thank it. you. I'm, I'm um, a normal hobbyist. Somebody says, uh, uh, Tardy says, um, what, uh, are some hints for good breedings? Uh, what to look for? So I'm not sure if that question is, um, when we're looking at what to buy or if if um, that means breeding something on our own. But either way, it's a good question. Either one would be a good question. I mean, what do yeah. you look for so, when you buy fish? Well, I, I actually look, if I know what the, you know, I go in a store, you know, there's a store around me that has uh, probably four or 500 discus in their store, you know, every time I go in there. And I, I look for a fish that has normal behaviors, you know, wh whatever that fish is. It, if it swims normally, if it, if it has good deportment, it, it comes out, you know, and faces you when you walk up to the tank, uh, swims normally, looking at the gills. You know, I, I look at external anatomy to begin with to, to see if there's outward appearances of, of any deformities or any parasites or any diseases. By looking at its behavior, you can tell a lot about what's going on with a fish. Yeah. And, and uh, that's, what, that's what you have to look for because you're going on faith that that store doesn't have diseases in its tank. You know what? Every store, no matter how clean it is, is going to have diseases, it's going to mm -hmm. have parasites. What causes the parasitical problems, and I, you know, I teach this in my aquaculture class, it's the stress in the fish. When stress hits your fish, they become susceptible to diseases. Same with humans. We're stressed out, we get cold. Well, you know, if, if a fish is not stressed in a tank at a store, it's impossible to see, you know, what else is going on. So you want to look at the behavior of the fish first. And, and that's what I look at. You know, color of the fish, that tells you a lot about its, you know, its quality. Yeah. It's, it's physiological quality as well as the quality of, of the fish itself. It tells you a lot about the diet too. I mean, carotenoids yes, exactly. and, uh, yep. you, you know, anthocyanins and stuff are really needed in that diet. So yep. it needs a round, well-rounded diet to present yep. well, unless it's a juiced fish, which we yep. talked but, about. But I was going to say, yes. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and, you know, for a long time, uh, one particular part of the world, I, I don't want to, you know, say who, we all know who, you know, hormone their young fish so you would buy a, a small discus you know two inches that would be just bright bright orange yeah you know, this is before the pigeon bloods came out well you know it's been hormone and if they're hormone at a very young age they're probably going to be sterile for one thing yeah uh, not good so, breeding fish no because how in tilapia aquaculture to produce all male fish 
uh, which grow faster, grow bigger, you give them hormones for the first two or three weeks of their life in their food. They'll all be males. Well, so in effect, they are sterile, you know, in many cases too. Yeah. So they put all their energy into growth. They don't have to worry about putting energy into uh, their their sex organs. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it it yet again. I mean, it's come up on this channel so many times. But buy from somebody you you trust and respect. Personally, yeah. I've worked with aquatic arts. That's why I represent them only uh, as breeders. I, I'll mention friends who own stores as check them out. But the only people that I know where I've like looked at their procedures and kind of checked in closely is them. And so I suggest you guys do the same. Find a source that, that you can believe in. If you want to take my advice or Dr. Maserol's advice, I mean, <laughs> then, then that's fine too. But uh, I would do the work myself if I were you and you care about the fish. Um, so we have another question, which is, uh, do you have any future aquarium club presentations on your schedule? I'm just go, I'm kind of going down the list. So we're, there's sure. a backlog of questions, but we'll um, get there. I am. I, I, the only one that's scheduled right this instant is the, the Portland aquarium group. The okay. Oregon uh, Aquarium Society, the same one you talked to a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. supposed to be talking to them uh, February 12th or 13th, that, that Saturday near Valentine's Day. Uh, and so that's the only one that I have coming up right now. Okay. Uh, but yeah. Great. But the, uh, the, the year is still young, so who knows? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there a lot of clubs are kind of still booking the yep. second half of the yep. year or into the spring and stuff. Yep. So uh, the whole COVID thing is just thrown a yep. monkey wrench and everything. Uh, only now is are things even returning to a lot of places. Um, okay, so Aqua Garden sa Zen says, what uh, education? Uh, level or uh, or level of education is needed to be a conservationist. Well, I'll just say you don't need any. I mean, just no. don't be a detriment to society and nature. And that's a huge part right there. I mean, honestly, just being doing your part. But uh, at that, I mean, educate yourself as much as you want. You do not need a, a degree to know something. Uh, I mean, there are many fish keepers that are a lot. I mean, I shouldn't say this because I don't have a degree in ichthyology, but I've met a lot of fish keepers that may know more about a specific aspect of fish keeping than a, someone with a PhD. And I know that's true in anthropology, archaeology, yeah. with all sorts of things. I mean, educate yourself. Um, you you have the power. I mean, you learn and then pass it on. Um, but check your facts and and vet your sources. I mean, that's don't trust yeah, me. Then, look into my, we, look into the track record. You know, we we can all be conservationists. Um, you know, you don't have to be you know a long haired hippie type. And, you know, I grew up <laughs> in the sixties. Those were the you know the flower children were the conservationists. No, I, you know, um, hunters are some of the biggest conservationists yeah, out there. there there's you know? a, there's a lot of ways of of being a hobbyist and being a you know and conserving being in the conservation area. Um, but, you know, a lot of conservation organizations take volunteers. You know, you can volunteer for a lot of conservation groups. Uh, but, you know, you can get a bachelor's degree in conservation biology. Uh, but, you know, you don't necessarily have to, to to be a conservation. To work in the conservation world, to be hired as a conservationist, yeah, you're probably going to need a, a bachelor's degree at least. Uh, but that... But that doesn't necessarily mean you can't do conservation work without it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, people like me weasel themselves into that world all the time. So yeah. um, let's see here. Uh, Leo uh, wants to know, can you keep Corydoras in the higher ranges, 82 to 84? Do they actually live in those conditions very often? Um, in the 80s, yes. In, in, in Akitos, there are, um, you know, two or three species of, of Akitos of, of Cori's that live alongside the the, the discus there. All right. Um, I was curious them. which species you see a lot of down there. Oh, uh, in in the Rio Nanai, we catch uh, Corridor Shuri. I think it's um, C fifty three. I'm I'm not quite sure, but um, you know, I this go this piggybacks off what you said just a few minutes ago. Um, Many hobbyists know a lot more 
of the fish species than fish biologists. Because I may only work with one or two fish. Who right. cares you're, about the other stuff? You know, yeah. the only you're, the only person I know who is a fish biologist that knows everything, knows every fish, is Dr. Paul Wazell. I mean, that guy's an encyclopedia of fish. I mean, you want him to talk off the cuff about, you know, some obscure fish species from the Arctic, even though there's no fish, you know, freshwater <laughs> fish there. Yeah. He can he can talk an hour about it and be exactly right. But you know, most of us work with one or two fish species, uh, and so you know, you guys know more about all the fish in a given area if it's your pet area that you like, you know. But we do, you know, there are a few species. Uh, Sheree is one. Um, you know, um, Julii. The oh, Julie okay. Cat yeah, is, Very is enough other that you find very common there as well uh so there are a number of, of catfishes that you can find there great uh you know and and i want to say too like that's not <laughs> what what i was saying too is not to discredit the work because you know what i want to i want to oh, no, build no. On, what, what i want to build on this channel is you know for years the, the the fish hobby has had this kind of uh barrier to entry uh and also kind of when you do science work or or um any sort of higher academia work. Uh, I mean, you've spent 30 years on something sometimes and it took you that long to come up with something that someone can read in 15 minutes and yeah. then feel like they know it. And you're the one who watched it happen, who put in, you know, 20 years of not knowing what was wrong with something and figuring it out, the, the minutia of it. And so that has a value. And when people go speak to clubs, they don't want their uh, intellectual property always shared right away. But I'm trying to break the habit in that I want to show that we care about that. And I, I think we can show people that we care about their work by funding their projects and their organizations and things like that. So, I mean, that's why, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be transparent and say that I, I didn't have any money to offer, offer Dr. Maserol here. I mean, you guys know what I operate on with the channel. Um, and I would love to, but I mean, it's, it's more of a chance to, so that we could get some publicity for his, his center. But I mean, there's a lot of people who don't want to speak online who are incredibly great sources, but it's because they've worked so hard. They'd rather speak to 20 or 30 people intimately in a room, uh, in a fish club and then be able to do that because they get some money for it. I mean, let's be frank about it. You give the same speech for four or five years and then you switch it up and then you give another one. And some people feel cynical about that model, but at the same time, um, there is a lot of hard work and time that goes into acquiring that, that knowledge. And the, the first generation that acquires the knowledge uh, that had to put the blood, sweat, and tears in is very, very defensive. So you kind of have to get a step away from that sometimes to get the, the the talk. So it's so incredible when we have people like you who will come speak to us openly. And then you also have in your lectures, I must say, a completely different, um, you know, you give a great presentation as well about like water uh, uh, properties and, and how different people... Uh, you gave a, a talk to our club about, you know, what people assume versus what the reality of water parameters and things are and the, the Amazon. So really, really fantastic stuff. But I just wanted to make that clear to the audience that that's an uphill fight we're fighting. And I don't want to charge you guys to have to watch. If you're a student or if you don't have money offhand, but you love fish, I want you guys to be able to come and learn with us. And so that's what we're trying to facilitate here. Um, all right, let's see here. Do you, uh, Chevy Fish, who is a, uh, thank you, Chevy Fish, for uh, helping with uh, moderating and everything. Do you, have you found that politics play a big role in what you're trying to do down there, doctor? Uh, is what they ask. Doctor. Um, <laughs> you know, politics does play, uh, you know. Um, I guess you got to be careful with that one, too. <laughs> yeah, you know, inter intertwined with politics is business, you know. Mm. Because, you know, it's just like it is everywhere. If, if you have money, you can control politics. So, you know, the, the, the big business there, if they want something changed, it, it, it gets changed. Uh, and it may be contrary to what science says, but, you know, 
it, it gets changed. And, and, you know, there's, there's been a big push on in a lot of the scientific organizations in the past five or six years to get involved in politics because the politicians, really, they're not scientists. You know, maybe you'll have a medical doctor, but, but you know, they're, they're a scientist in certain aspects, but, you know, when it comes to the environment, they know no more than most people in reality. And so there's been a push in America to get more of our scientists into politics. Uh, and so, but yeah, Brazil, Peru, you know, throughout the Amazon, you know, uh, politics plays a, a big role in, in environmental issues all over the yeah. place. I mean, look at Brazil, what's happened in Brazil with the deforestation. That, that's a big political issue. I mean, um, last year, know, far, or two years ago, farmers in protest lit everything they could on fire um, <laughs> yep. to start mm -hmm. forest fires. I mean. Yep, that's exact, to, to remove forests so they can farm more, you know. And so, right. uh, it. Eat less beef. You know, I, I mean, I, I eat beef, yeah, but get, I'm going to say there's things we yep. can do. You have to decide how far you want to go. <laughs> and, and sometimes the government doesn't know what to do. I, you know, I, I gave a, a talk to the high government officials in Cambodia uh, once when I was when I first started working in Cambodia. It, this was at the secretary of state level, just just right below the, the you know, the prime minister. And, and I met with them and I presented some work that I'd been doing in Peru and what it could mean for Cambodia. And the, the Minister of the Environment asked me in front of everybody, what should we do in Cambodia? I, I was very taken back at that. You know, I, I yeah. was not expecting someone who, you know, been living there, asking yeah. the person <laughs> who only had been in the country 10 hours, what should we do in our country? And, and I looked at him and, and honestly said, you know, I'm not one of those people who come into a situation and tell you what you need to do as an outsider. You as a government, you as a people have to decide what's more important to the people, to your government. Is it becoming the rice producing region of the world? And that's what they want to do. They wanted to try to do really intensive rice culture so they could export more rice. Well, to do that, they have to use insecticides, pesticides, herbicides, which is terrible for their environment. But even worse so is that the rice fields are where the traditional fishing grounds of the people. Is. They catch mm -hmm. all the little fish in the rice fields, and that's their traditional food. So right. I said, what's more important? your economy or to conserve your environment so the people can use it. And I, and I told him, I can't tell you what you should do. You, you have to decide that for yourselves, what you think the best route for your country is. And, and, right. and so, you know, it, it's, again, it's a political issue, but it's also a conservation environmental issue. Yeah. And I, I just want to I just want to throw out there, too, that the question comes at a good time because our next guest is probably going to be Lawrence Kent. And it's going to be about collecting fish in conflict zones where you have a gun in your face kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so we can talk about that more then, too. So uh, I'll hop on to another question. But um, uh, there's another one, which is. Uh, oh, this is a great question. Kay Holiday uh, says. Are there uh, any fish that aren't currently in the hobby that you think would be good ones that you see locally there in Iquitos? Um, you know, some of the some of the catfish um, <laughs> aren't very common in the hobby. Um, some of the caracids. There is a. Uh, unfortunately, it is a uh, um, a food fish. So uh, unless things change. It yeah. will never, um, it, well, I know some people who have it in the hobby. Maybe they get it from Colombia. It's what they, the locals call sardina. It's uh, tripopterus. It's a, it's kind of shaped like a hatchet fish. Uh, so some people actually call it the giant hatchet. That's oh, a yeah, great, yeah. A great schooling fish. A really yeah. great schooling fish. They're it's big. Right <laughs> through the body and, and a, a, a trilobed. Cobble fin, so it has mm -hmm. like a little 
uh, peak outside the caudal fin. That, that's a nice, pretty fish. Not spectacularly colored, but when they get in schools, you know, it's a majestic school. And yeah. that would be a, a great fish to have in the hobby if, you know, if you had a big enough tank for them. Yeah, um, so, I I did a tour at a at, in Portland actually of, of my friend Kenny of Danakin Aquatics. If you look at any of his fish room tours, he has a school of about nine of those in a tank, mm -hmm. and they're they're really majestic fish. They're in a hundred and eighty yep. gallon tank, and they yep. they're big for that tank, honestly. Yep. But but yep. they're cool. There was some piran piran piranid type fish, you know. Um, okay, uh, okay. So another question by Dean. Uh, Bayens is uh, if fishermen participate in the aquaculture project that you're doing, are they required to strictly raise native species or do you think that they'll start raising whatever cells um, and is there any way to enforce them breeding the endemic species? Well, there is a law in Peru that says in order to export a fish out of Peru, it has to be a native fish. Ah, so you, you, you can't export... Handy. You can't export non-native fish out of Peru. Now, nothing says you can't sell it within Peru, but the Peruvian tropical fish market is not that big. Uh, and, and so, you know, I have a lot of friends who, who breed guppies in Iquitos who, or who breed bettas. Uh, but, they're, you know, it's, it's small compared to, uh, you know, what's going on in the United States. You know, it's... Most people can't afford tropical fish. You know, right. The, the, food is more of a concern, yeah, right? Food yeah. is more of a concern. It may be the people from Lima and some of the bigger cities, Arequipa, the, the, the more wealthier people may, may have aquariums. But, you know, most people, an uh, aquarium is a super luxury that yeah. they just can't afford. Yeah, definitely. Um, so another one, another question is, uh, are there any differences uh, or what are some of the differences? Uh, Steph uh, C2 asks uh, between tank raised and wild fish, like the ones you work with specifically, is there is there a way to tell or anything in the hobby or is that come down to trusting your source it, again? It comes down to trusting your source. You know, I, I will tell you, you know, Discus has always have always had a bad rap, um, you know, and primarily because at first when discus, you know, it, were in the hobby, they were mostly wild caught and wild caught do tend to need more specific water conditions. Um, but now with domestically bred discus, you, you don't need to have discus that are domestically bred necessarily in nice, soft, low pH water. You want to try to match the water that the breeder had. And if he was able to breed his fish in, you know, soda water, basically like we have here in Southern California, that's what you want your water to be. Yeah. Because what we're doing is we're artificially selecting for fish that can handle that water. So they're no, they're so far away from the wild fish that they, you know, they, they're, they're not the same fish anymore. So you, you really have to know, the conditions that your fish that you bought were raised in, whether it was a wild fish or a domestically raised fish. Okay. And really, that's that's what you want to look for. And that's really the main difference between the two. Sure. You know, all wild all wild fish have parasites. Yeah. But that's that's just a fact of life. I mean if you ever get an import in, you'll yep. see like how yep. many times you have to de parasite everything. Yeah. And and most wild fish when you catch them don't look nice. They have <laughs> yeah. chunks bitten out of their fins. Or everything, yeah. You know, every tetra is fin nipping it. So you're not going to find this nice, beautiful fish, especially with a discus. Nice round discus when you first get them, when you catch them in the wild or, you know, they're in a, a ex, exporter's tank. You know, they're, they're going to need time to recuperate. It's a rough life and out there. <laughs> it's, our, it's, it's a fish eat fish world out there for sure. Yeah, definitely. Well, we have a couple more questions and then we'll wrap it up. But uh, this is a question and um, yeah, maybe your uh, environmental science degree. I know botany is not necessarily the focus of that, but um, I've taught botany before, though. Oh, have you? Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I taught botany for many years. Yep. Okay, great. So do you have any thoughts on uh, plant allopathy or or uh, chemopathy, whatever you want to call it? Uh, in in uh, in the aquarium hobby at all? 
Like, you know, do you think there's plants that harm fish or that are at war with each other in our aquatic hobby at all that that you're aware of or anything like that? Uh, I'm not. I'm not aware of any, but you know, um, I'm sure it's out there. You know, just with plant extracts, when a, a, a plant lives, you know, it, it's it's a a bog type plant. It's it's leaching off lots of, of stuff from its body. And yeah. a lot of places you'll find maybe one or two species of plants and that's it. Even though there's a lot of others around, you know, there's got to be something going on, whether it's, you know, they not true allelopathy, but they're blocking out the sun. They're absorbing more of the nutrients, you know, like you see underneath shade trees, you know, not much grows underneath the shade tree, not necessarily because of allelopathy, but because the trees are absorbing all the nutrients, or, you know, taking all the sun. So you probably see more of that in aquatic plants than we think about. Sure. You know, and to tell you, you know, I, my, one of my big pet peeve is when you see a tank that is a Amazonian aquascape. So you have Amazon <laughs> sword plants, you have. You shouldn't have too many plants in that tank. <laughs> Ellison area. No, you don't, you know, you never see submerged plants in yeah. the water there you know you the only plants you ever see are the grasses that kind of come from the land into the into the water or you see water hyacinths and water or treetops <laughs> yeah or treetops i mean you don't you don't see the typical aquarium plants in yeah. you know in the northern part of uh, peru or really throughout the amazon it's really in the pantanal it's, it's in the plains area where you get the flood plains is where you find all those plants yeah. So, you know, an aquascaped Amazonian aquarium should be leaf litter, some twigs, maybe a rock. I mean, you don't see <laughs> rocks at all. It's all mud, but that's about it. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't claim to have an aquascaped aquascop, discus tank behind me because it's in my living room. People want to see plants. So I have a couple plants in there and some wood for my discus. But, you know, I, I wouldn't have plants if I... My wife didn't say, hey, you need some plants in there. Instead of so biotope, I, I say bio, you know, biotype. Biotype, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's something like a bio, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a mental biotope. Yeah. It def <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, it doesn't mean that that's not the right way to keep fish either. He's not, exactly, yeah, you know, yeah. no one's saying that. It's just, uh, no. uh, we don't have tanks that are, uh, you know, the size of a warehouse and have limited visibility and, and yep. silty mud for the fish to live in. So right. yeah. uh, maybe plants are, work for some things. Um, so another question that's a really good one is, oh. um, <laughs> I think it's a really good one, uh, is uh, do fish in the wild eat their young like they do in captivity? Uh, is it something based on the food availability or is it really like, you know, is it a, st a stress slash confinement, you know, space issue that, that we see more of that from? Well, most fish do not have parental care. Mm -hmm. And because they're, you know, let, let's don't talk cichlids, you know, cichlids yeah. show the <laughs> wide range of parental care. Let's say a typical neon tetra, tetra. It's going to be an egg scatterer. And when it sees something flicking around in the leaf litter, it's going to think it's food. So, yeah, there, there's cannibalism, you know, with parents and juveniles and uh, babies all over the place. You know, that's just that's just what it is. You know, it, it happens in the aquarium. It happens in the wild, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. The fish, I, I... All a fish is doing, it's looking for food in order to have sex. Yeah, that's really the two things yeah. that are important. Of course, trying to escape predators, but you know, the, those guppies are, those don't are care. The three things that a fish does every day, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's you know, yeah. They they did a st actually. Uh, <laughs> David Resnick once again did a study where they found that the females would rather get eaten by a predator than be chased by the males who are always dancing and that the males would dance right in front of fish eating them uh if if they were like already on a, a mission yep. to woo a certain female yep. <laughs> so uh 
yeah, that should tell you something about their instinct there. Um, yeah, no, so that's, I mean, that's, that's really interesting though, uh, about that because I've seen, I've seen Rasboras and Tetras literally lay eggs and then swim down to the bottom and eat their own eggs like in 30 seconds. So, you know, I, I was wondering if the wild, they kind of swim away faster and that helps a little bit, but, uh, you know, um, uh, all right. Yeah. So, uh, are you good with, uh, like two more questions? I'm, hey, I'm okay. I'm free. All right. So, uh, uh, another one is, um, uh, lady Diane wants to know, uh, what is the most important fish you think we could keep in our tanks as hobbyists, uh, to help your area of research? Is it like the care species or where could we find information on, on what we should be keeping? Like, as far as, uh, I guess, I mean, it, I'm, I'm assuming they mean as, a, as, as an arc, you know, uh, like yeah. Noah's Ark yeah. kind of species. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, you know, first I would say keep the fish that you like to keep, you know, re regardless of what it is, if it's a care species or not a care species. If you look at your hobby as a job, then it doesn't become enjoyable. You know, that, that's first and foremost. Um, but if there are species that are still being brought into the hobby um, that are that are care species, then, then why not? Why not try to keep a species alive in the hobby? Um, and, you know, and, and give them to other hobbies. You know, like, yeah. take them to your club, hand them out say hey why don't you try to spawn these as well and and try to disperse those fish as you know as widely as possible but it has to be a fish that you enjoy keeping because if you don't enjoy watching that fish just looking at your aquarium then it, it, it's not a hobby anymore and I, i'm right. a firm believer in the hobby i mean that's you know you can see the tank behind me I, you know this is i may be a fish biologist but it's still my hobby. I still enjoy looking into that window to the sea, so to speak, behind me. Uh, you know, nothing is more relaxing just sitting there watching the fish swim around. And yeah. Whether I want to breed them or not, you know, that's, that's I, my view is if my fish breed, oh, they breed. But, you know, I, I, you, you start breeding fish, you start thinking, oh, I can make a million dollars off this fish. You know, it happens to everybody. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can I can sell those fish. Well, I, you know, you're probably not going to be able to, you know, maybe one generation, but you know, especially if, if it's really if obscure, it's, you'll sell it to like twelve people, and then yep. you're going to start being like, all right, who wants it for three dollars? Yep. <laughs> yeah, you might sell yep. those first ones for a hundred, but yeah, but I but I know that's a cop out to say, take get the fish you enjoy, but I, I you know I I really believe that conservation still happens there. Because conservation happens with you when you have the appreciation of the environment, uh, and and that's the first step in truly conserving something is if you have an appreciation for it. You know, it's yeah. not because it's worth so many dollars. It's not worth you know. It's that you have a true appreciation of of the beauty of what it is, just for what it is. That's beautifully put. Thank you. I, I really like that. And I mean, also care species is a good place to start, but yep. even if you try to look at the IUCN red list and things like that, I mean, I work with aquatic arts. Um, I, they're, they're who I work with that. I'm, I have to say that, you know, just as you know, I get a kickback from what they sell if you use my code in the description, <laughs> but, but uh, they are, they actually don't go by it cares or the IUCN they talk to biologists around the world and that helps them determine what to keep because there's a lot of politics with the IUCN and 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 like even the red list yes if it's critically endangered it'll probably get on the list eventually but there's a lot of threatened or near threatened fish that stay off that list because they're a part of the economy locally and so yeah. Right now, for instance, uh, a lot of the micro rasboras that are native to Myanmar and Thailand and the Malay Peninsula, uh, even parts of Borneo, they're realistically they should probably be on that list, yep. uh, and they're not. 
Um, so they're good. A lot of those little fish get overlooked and they're a good fish to, yep. to check into at least. Um, all right. Yep. So I want to end it because we have, we have a lot of questions, but um, I think we got a good one here to end it on, which is, Okay, so we know you like discus. So you let us know that yep. they're they're probably your favorite fish. But what other fish uh, are you keeping? And, and are there any dream fish in the Amazon? That if you had all the money in the world, the biggest tank in the world, you know, what fish would you keep? Or what kind of tank? Uh, well, you know, uh, I, we have a swimming pool in our backyard. My wife will not let me use it as a pond. Ah, uh, so but. <laughs> You know, no matter what, um, they never do. <laughs> no, uh, you know, I, I if it's not a discus, okay, there's so, still some varieties of discus that I would love to have. Oh, uh, I, you know, m my first fish that I really liked were catfish. So, uh, you know, I would say some of the quarries are are, are pretty nice that that are throughout uh, the Amazon. Uh, but but they're also fish from Southeast Asia that I like. You know, I like some of the the barbs, some of the minnows that they have in Southeast Asia, that you know I've I've collected. You know, to to catalog it in Cambodia, where we're just gorgeous. Some of the okay. betta species. I used to be a betta breeder. Uh, then you know, cleaning a thousand bottles and jars every day got you know that became a job, and I didn't want to do that anymore. So, you know, there there are a lot of fish that. I would like to have it. So it's really difficult for me to say one fish. You know, I have discus in my fish room. I have angelfish, wild and domestically raised angelfish, um, you know, epistogrammas. I, I have a, a lot of, you know, a little of a lot of things in, in my fish room. And, you know, how many people have lungfish in their fish room? You know, I have three lungfish. So I, I like <laughs> the oddball stuff too, you know, but it's probably within the Amazon's probably some of the catfish species, some of the wood cats. Probably oh yeah. The, probably the orca wood cat would be the one that I would really like to get my hand on. That and was I know one some of my people favorite. Have them. I you know, them. Eric, <laughs> Eric Thomas has, has some, you know, and, yeah. you know, he's trying to breed them. And so it, I just like the, the Tatia mosaicas. Yeah. 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 Oh, they're so you beautiful. Know, <laughs> I, you know, I have, I have some Tatias in my fish room, you know, the, uh, the little leopard Perugier in, in my mm -hmm. fish room, which I, I love, you know, I, so I, I'm kind of partial to catfish. Yeah. I love them too. I, if I could have anything, I think it might be a Jaguar catfish in a proper sized enclosure, yep. which would be like yep. what a thousand, 2000 gallons. <laughs> yeah. There, so. There's a large catfish called the, the lince catfish, the lince catfish that is from Peru that, that come in about maybe a foot, two feet long. But those are probably juveniles. They really don't know much about the life history of those. I've seen pictures of fish that look very similar that are about six feet long. Wow. Didn't have a name described to them, but they, they look like they were lince cats. And so, uh, you know, we'll, yeah. we'll have lince cats in the aquarium. And we'll see how big they get. Maybe they get to be six feet long. Yeah, that'd be cool to find yeah. out. At least yep. you can always let them go in the river it, we're there yep. rather than, uh, you know, if it yep. gets too big. <laughs> that's right exactly all right well thank you so much uh dr uh, Maz or anthony i mean I'll, anthony. I'll say anthony to end it but you know i really yep. we really appreciate it i think we had a good time tonight uh people will be watching this there's some people who ask questions and i i urge you to go back and watch the beginning of the stream uh because some of the questions were oh no not you i mean <laughs> I mean, well, me, you, I mean you can, but I mean other people because they're asking questions that you answered earlier on. Oh, okay, but and, and so I, yeah. If there's questions that we haven't gotten to, yeah, agree, it, but I'll go through the chat and you know, or people mm -hmm. can email me if they have specific questions, you know, about that's fish so or, cool, you know, about you know, uh, about how how to get to where I am, you know, how what's the educational process, what's good universities, things of that sort, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm willing to discuss most things to most people. <laughs> That's I so cool. Discuss no politics, no religion. Other than that, I'm, I'm fair game. Right on. Well, thank you so much. And again, you guys That's follow good. follow the work of the Research Center and Dr. Uh, Maseral and his wife is very active in that work too. Uh, Renee is also very active. And uh, if you guys are interested, please contact him. Uh, the link is pinned right now in the in the chat, and then it'll be 
in the uh, in the in the description that drops down, I'll update it with any relevant uh, work he's doing in the next few months. I'll make sure to come back and, and update this if he has, does any sort of series or talks or anything that are uh, public. But um, talk to your local fish clubs about having him come out. I mean, uh, it's still I love early. I fish clubs. So, you know, I, I enjoy looking at fish stores all over the country, all over yeah. the world. Just, just look at what's what the local people find in there, you know, as fish that they keep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again. And I always like to let the guest have the last word of the show. So I'll leave it to you after I just say thank you to all the viewers and uh, mods and uh, people who donated and everything. Thank you. But uh, uh, I really appreciate those of you guys who make this possible. So you can have the last um, word. <laughs> last words is, you know, get involved, no matter what it is at your local level. Um, there's a lot of organizations out there that, that, you know, are looking after our local waterways, our international waterways. Just get involved locally, volunteer. Um, you know, Citizen scientists are very important now to science. We're, we're realizing how important citizen scientists are. And that's you as hobbyists. We're all citizen scientists. You know, we all have something that we can provide and give input to the conservation around us. So I say get involved. All right, guys. Have a good one. And uh, I'll, very much. I'll see everybody tomorrow because we just hit the 25,000 subscriber mark over the weekend. And uh, I'm so happy about that. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. We're going to end it here, though. Uh, okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you.